Hello, um, I'm Robin Watson, president of Women in Film and Television Atlanta and board member for Women in Film and Television International. And welcome to Nordic Women in Film. Um, before we get started with our great discussion, please welcome Icelandic ambassador to the U.S. Burgess Elitsforter to say a few words. Ambassador? Thank you so much, Robin. Um, and um, thank you for including me with a minor role in this very important discussion here today. Um, I want on behalf of the Embassy of Iceland to, to welcome you all to this discussion, which is in connection with the fifth and the last week of our very fantastic virtual film festival, which was dedicated to Nordic women, of course, and least and not last, the uh, focus today is on Iceland. Um, and uh, I. I, we will, the film we have chosen to be shown in this uh, festival for Iceland is And Breathe Normally by uh, Icelandic director Isolt Ökadottir, who I very much look forward to hearing from uh, later on. Uh, from this series, uh, some of you have been following it from the start. You have seen that the Nordics, we tend to stick together. And uh, we have collaborated on events such as this one here in Washington uh, together. And uh, we feel that this is a very uh, fruitful and good way to get across in the United States. And um, uh, I just wanted to thank women in film and television international, as well as women in film and, and video Washington DC uh, for, for all the hard work and putting together this great program. Um, the film, and breathe normally, um, which some of you have seen and some of you are about to see, and I do envy those who have not seen it yet, it takes place um, uh, in a peninsula in Iceland, Reykjanes. Um, and you might have heard from the news that actually there where the film takes place, uh, partly, uh, we now have so many earthquakes. And as we speak, we might be, um, uh, the earth might be opening up and uh, we might have uh, an eruption on our hands <laughs> whilst we are doing this program. Uh, but the film is also a, an eruption and, and is tackling a lot of very, very important issues, timely issues, uh, such as on refugees, racism, LGBTQ issues, and, and the very Icelandic, I thought, aspect of, of the struggling of single mothers uh, in Iceland and elsewhere. So that's a very kind of in, interesting mix. Um, you, we were told that this uh, program is not about gender equality. It's about art and craft. So I'm not going to talk about how uh, male dominated the film industry is. And uh, I'm not going to talk about how necessary uh, all these women and female voices we have experienced in the last weeks are. So, but you know, that's a discussion I would very much like to have, but as I understand, we are talking about making films and making uh, films, uh, women making films. So, so that's an important aspect. And we have really great people here today and I'm actually starstruck. So I'm not going to have this very long. I just want to say um, how grateful we are for this and how much, how what an exceptional experience it has been to see the films and follow the debates uh, that have followed. So for me, all I want to say is I very much look forward to hearing all these great women here today. So thank you. And thank you for that, Ambassador. And, you know, I'm delighted we're going to start off our conversation with a film and breathe normally um, that can currently be seen on Netflix. Um, and, and, and I'm honored to have the film's director, Isold Ugodotter, and the film's lead actress, Christine Thola, to chat about the film. So welcome, ladies. Can't wait to see your faces. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello to you both. Thanks. Welcome. Hi. And, and, and I'm, excite, I'm excited to, uh, to be like moderating this panel because, you know, when I saw the film, I was like, oh, I have so many questions. And I was like, oh, wait, I get to ask them <laughs> or I get to have the conversations with the two ladies that I'd love to hear the conversations on. So, so first off, so Iso, like, tell us a little bit, like, what was behind this film? How did you get involved in it? And what, 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 do you, what, do you, what was your purpose for like doing this film? 
Yeah. Well, I had um, studied in New York City. I lived there for 10 years and I moved back to <clears throat> to Iceland uh, nearly 10 years ago, actually. And uh, I wanted to make a film. Um, <clears throat> so tackling poverty, that was the beginning um, idea. <clears throat> Tackle a story where a mother would be struggling with her child. <clears throat> I wanted to have a cat in the, in the film. And I had this image in my head of of seeing a mother and a child and a cat living in a car. And this was somewhat originally inspired by the economic crisis of Iceland, which I followed fr from across the ocean. And, um, and so I spent a bit of time developing that narrative. And I had this visual of maybe seeing a child try to put a cat into a seatbelt. There was something kind of sad, but funny that I could imagine you know, tragic circumstances, but yet with, with some layer of humor. And, um, but as that evolved, uh, that story evolved, I also began noticing a growing number of refugees in Iceland. And I read all kinds of stories of people setting them, trying to set themselves on fire or try to flee onto a ship or a boat. Uh, just this, the, the str dire straits were such that people would try to do anything. And I, I found it to be so you know, tragic that I wanted to really make a story about that rather. So here I was in the middle of a, of a script with the mother, child, cat. And I mm -hmm. thought, how can I tackle both of these uh, subjects, but in one film? And uh, I mean, then it's, you know, I could sit here for an hour to explain what happened next. Right. But basically me at the library, trying to piece things together, but also doing research, becoming a refugee, um, a um, volunteer at the Red mm -hmm. Cross mm -hmm. and um, going to all the panels, visiting people, making sure that I had all the information as in my biggest fear was always to make uh, something that didn't feel true. It didn't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was that, that fear drove the ambition of getting it right. So, and so for Chris, I mean, and, and I can totally see how you start one place and then you have some other ideas and I love how it all came together. So, um, but Christina, so what, you know, when you read the script and you saw the story, like what made you say, oh, I want to be part of this? Um, Isolt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I really wanted to, to work with her. And I actually, I took the script and went to a, a cottage in the countryside and I just sat there and um, I just had goosebumps and I was just crying and I just felt, uh, yeah, I just have to do this. I just have to be part of this story. And I just, I loved the, loved all the characters and, mm -hmm. and yeah, and their fight. And, and, their, and their fight, right? What each character yeah. like how each character like kind of hit you in, in, in different ways and different. So, so I want to go to my favorite character, not really my favorite character, but, but piece of it. And you hit on it, Musi, the cat. I, I mean, <laughs> so it's funny because I watched it one time and then I watched it again. And I was like, wow, like Musi has like a, a huge role. So, <laughs> and I feel like, I feel like, I, like I needed to talk about that. So it, I'm glad you kind of brought that up, Isolde, about like you, you saw a vision with, you know, a woman and a child and a cat. So, so thank you for explaining that. But is there a larger meaning behind you see? Because I, I think besides being like the character that kind of brings them together, like, is there more? I feel like there's a hidden meaning with the cat. Well, um, I feel like every character as small as they are, they all mm -hmm. need a purpose. They all need mm -hmm. some, like, so everybody has their own battle. And, you know, for the mother of, of El Tar, the boy, it's mm -hmm. to take care of him and to, to secure a home and to, you know, be a proper citizen. And, you know, um, the um, Adia, who, who is traveling from, um, from Guinea-Bissau, she, she mm -hmm. is going to reunite also with her family. So everybody's, you know, has, has a purpose. And I wanted to give him, like, something that was such a big deal for him that if he would lose it, it would, it would, you know, it, it would change everything. And then that, you know, I don't even remember anymore how it all came, came together, but it, by losing him, um, it kind of, you know, 
creates a turning point in the story. Right. Yeah. It, it, it brings the character. Yeah, it brings the characters. To, it, but yeah. Yeah, and brings the, the characters yeah. together. Exactly. And, and, and not just brings them together. I mean, it's the thing, right? It is the thing. Yeah. So, gives, so look. Yeah. Go ahead. It gives the child, a, you know, purpose and it gives him meaning. Mm -hmm. he, has, mm -hmm. he has a role in, in this world. This is his role. Right. To be the right. character of the cats. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. It was just something that I, at some point I had, you know, seen where I would see him maybe with like a, a leash because I thought it's so funny, you know, people so there are people mm -hmm. take a cat out on a leash. Right. And just, you know, just that he would go over the top in in being the caretaker. Yeah. So Christine, it, it, it did the character like working with the cat, like did did you kind of feel it's the the cat's importance as you were like going through like at working mm -hmm. with the cat. I'm also amazed too with any you know actors who work with animals. Like, how do you like adjust <laughs> if if the cat's not having a good day or something? <laughs> yeah, he the cat is the most prima donna I have worked with. You know, he was just like <laughs> under the seat of the car, and he was I'm not going there. And we were all just like trying to give him candy and waiting for half an hour for the cat to be ready. And in uh. In drama school, I was told it's it's very difficult to work with animals and children, right. <laughs> and, but both the cat and Pat, it just, oh, it was such an amazing time. And it was uh, everything that Isolde talks about. It has this deeper meaning in every scene and it just right. Right. takes you right to the core. Yeah. Right. But I love that. That's I love Moosey. <laughs> yeah, we love Mies and Mies too. I, he was. I was going to ask that question first, so I'm glad you saw brought it mm -hmm. up. Um, so let's go to an, another character. I'm going to work my way, kind of like through. So let's go to Edgar, and I love his innocence, right? Um, the the innocence of like a young boy, but and it's also kind of like he is like the thing, like right. I mean, as his mother, like he's the reason why you're doing things a certain way. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. one part in the film um, when you go kind of go back to like your old ways and and, and go back to the guy you know want to stay needed mm -hmm. a place to stay, and you you could have had a couch, but then you looked around you, and you you didn't think about yourself, right? You thought about him. So. Um, his character is more than just kind of like the boy in in the play. So I mean, in the movie. So like, tell me a little bit, like, how was it working with him, as well as the cat? Like, did you did you kind of have to look at him like differently and and say, I know this is a little kid, but he plays like an important role in kind of how I'm going to focus as a as a as an actress, but also his his character. How was yeah, it working it, with him? He was absolutely amazing. And uh, I have a, I have myself, I have a son that is one year younger than him. So okay. I really was right. trying to, uh, you know, talk, trying to talk about things that I know are interesting right. for, uh, for his age. Cause it's, mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was the mother role that was just so huge in the mm -hmm. part. Cause, and because that's also, uh, Adja also as a mother, that's mm -hmm. fi fighting for her child in, in mm -hmm. such different situations. And uh, for me, it was just huge that people would believe in our bond and believe that they had to feel. I wanted every mother that was watching, not every mother, just everybody watching to feel with her the fight mm -hmm. as a mother doing her best, trying to get a second chance. Um, so it was very important. And his role was extremely important and he was just so positive also it's just the best co-actor I've ever worked with <laughs> and like, right. yeah he was just it was and uh, yeah he's it was, that, that, it was great that's great and and I and I do want to touch on like the the motherly thing right I mean for you, you guys the two characters um and at, at, you know at Isolde is somebody the, the script writer like it was purposely like kind of written this way but did you you both bring kind of your own life experiences to it. Um, you saying mm -hmm. you or had a son. So, you know, I, the first thing I noticed and maybe just because it's been heightened and kind of something I recognize is that, um, you know, same, like same women, but two different races, right? Um, yeah. Would, would, the, would the film play differently, uh, Isolde? Maybe it's just directed at you if the 
characters were both the same race or did race, you know, them being, you know, uh, different races, I, look, I know purposeful, but with the story, do you feel like the story would have been different if they were the same race? I mean, cause it's, it's basically, you know, one, one character, even though she was black, you know, it, it was about like trying to get asylum and, and escape, you know, something terrible that happened to her. But it, it, so in that respect, women are women, right? Just trying, kind of looking out for themselves so they can get to their children or be the best mothers. But having them as different races, did that play into, was that purposely or, you know, was it, she just happened to be the best actress for the role, black or white? Like what, what yeah. was the thinking behind yeah, that? I mean, originally, because I had, uh, you know, taken on that role at the, um, the um, Iceland Red Cross, working, mm -hmm. you know, making friends with a woman from Uganda. So, you know, I will admit that I was very much inspired by that story and, okay. um, and she was very generous in, you know, giving me information. And so, um, so I think, you know, on some level, yes, on the surface, you know, I'm bringing together people from two different, entirely different worlds. But then I feel like the closer we get, we begin to understand, you know, their similarities. Uh -huh, um, absolutely. So hopefully that was, you know, something that hopefully comes across on some level. Um, uh, both of them are outsiders to, to some extent, of course, somebody who, who is seeking asylum is, is, you know, the ultimate outsider because they don't even have a nation to call their own. Mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's, it's the most difficult of all because you, the, your support system is so limited. Nobody. Almost, yeah. Almost none. And, um, but at the same time, you know, this Icelandic mother who is perhaps her own worst enemy who kind of rejects, admitting to the system or to her environment mm -hmm. that there is a huge problem that she is incapable of handling her life she, she can't deal with it and so things have been kind of gradually spir spiraling out of control and it's not until um you know the woman who she's partially uh responsible for you know affecting her the future of of, of adya it's, mm -hmm. it's that woman who sees through this, you know, mm -hmm. sees through it all. So, um, you know, maybe one of my favorite scenes for the first scene that I was most afraid of is this we scene called the moment of truth where they sit in the car together and they really yes. kind of put, put their cards on the table and they bond in some strange, weird, uncomfortable mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. because they are forced to, because they have to, because it's at, it's at this point where um, we can't even continue pr pretending like right. these events right. happened, took place. But um, so, you, you know, if I, to, to simplify my answer, was race, you know, conscious? It, you know, probably yes, because of this desire to tell a story. Right. Uh, originally, the idea was somebody from Uganda because they, they had the Kill the Gays bill, uh, which yes. you may recall from 2014. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was an original motivation. That idea evolved somewhat, especially because we found Papetita Sadio, who's from um, Brussels, amazing talent. And I thought, I'm not going to run after somebody from some country. I, you know, we found this incredible talent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna we're gonna pick talent over, you know, um, citizenship. That's, right. You know, That's. And I re I re recalled. And you know something I had I learned in film school, you know, always choose talents over anything else. Like somebody's, you're like, oh, I had the idea that somebody would be blonde or this or that. I'm like, no, right, no, right. No, no. It's the best performer for the role. That's right. gonna be the movie. So that's what I I remembered always. Like, it's the best performer for the role, whatever they look like. Right. So so, so Christine, it, it, I mean for like me, it seemed like you guys like had this bond, like you, it, like genuine, I mean, great, great actresses, right then. But <laughs> it, it seemed like, oh, they could really be friends in like real life. Like if yeah. the story continues, they would keep in contact with each other. Um, but one of the things that it's, it, two things that, that struck me with the, with the like relationship. It's like you, you both recognize kind of who you were, right? Mm -hmm. but you didn't really say it and you really didn't 
Like it wasn't like a negative, like you didn't, it wasn't used as like a negative thing for like your relationship. It was just like, oh yeah, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. And then you were like, and and so for you, for your character, I feel like you kind of took that and that's where that kind of ownership for like helping her and making sure that she was okay. And, And for her, it was more like, what like was she really involved in it? How like what was your role in like her not getting through um the border? And so how did like that play out as you were kind of like continuing with all the scenes and you know how did you kind of like keep that like chemistry going um and make it, and wanting people to recognize that y'all did realize who you were, but you mm. didn't hold it against each other, right? Um because I think that that was an important piece of the film. Yeah. So yeah, the, the 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 that character that we were just trying to hold the tension yes. all the time. Yeah. Well, me and Papatita, we really have a good friendship, and still today, okay. and we call each other yeah. like, <laughs> uh, and we just uh, we work in the same way, and we were but just really, really, we found it was really important that um, exactly that element that they would right. see in each other and always just the subtle yes the subtleness things that it's are great. not said in words and it was just uh-huh. yeah we just it, we didn't need to force it it just kind yeah. of every scene we just looked in the eye of each other each other's eyes and we just it was there and, and, and that's like, what I, and I felt that I mean I, yeah. look I've, I've seen being in the film and television industry and like you know and, and getting films and reading scripts and then, you know, moderating panels and stuff. Like, I really felt like that. I was like, I feel like they have like this genuine, like, yeah. person, like they could be friends. Um, so that was good that that came through. Yeah, and, yeah. And we also the, wanted, it's all right. Yeah, no, go ahead. we wanted also to bring like the element in the, in the, just the, the subtle element. I believe in you, I can see you. And they both need a second chance. They both need somebody right. who just doesn't judge them and, you know, right. we wanted that to kind of, we talked about that on the, when we met at Isol's house and we we're going through a script okay. and, and we start, me and Babati started crying and <laughs> because we really right. wanted to get that element. You know, it's just such a important sometimes to somebody just sees you. Yeah. And, and I think we as women like need that, like we need to connect with women yeah. on so many different levels because we we inherently we do so I you know I was pleased to like kind of see that come come through um, so that's great um, I can add also add to that um, I mean of course they didn't know each other before because you know Christian Thora is from Iceland Papatita uh-huh. is from Belgium um, but they did share this quality both both of them in their casting sessions you know separately that this really like kind of intense drive that you can see, you know, through where they, you know, they come and they come very well prepared and you, you know, mm-hmm. you watch a, a scene that you've written and you, when you've written something, you'll feel, always feel a bit self-conscious, like, oh, the writing, I don't know how it's going to work. Right. And when somebody delivers the scene and you forget it, you know, you've written right. it, you start to believe them as, as real life characters. I had the same feeling on both auditions for both of them where I didn't have to worry anymore about my words because right. they, because if they became their words, which was- They very, would do your words justice. They would yeah, they were doing you, your words justice. You, forget, you stop, stop overthinking what you've written because when somebody delivers your lines and is not a great actor, your lines feel terrible. So mm-hmm. you're like, well, I have to go re- rewrite this because it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so then that similar quality is kind of, ambitious intensity then was something they they both were very did you know did their homework separately in their own mm-hmm. ways and it always came on set like ready to kill it you know right <laughs> so there was you know and it was probably somewhat in an intense set sometimes because everybody was doing working so hard and wanting to deliver the best possible performance that they could mm-hmm. and uh, right. so so and I can so that's that's for that this reason I can see how they can also bond as people because they share this love for the the craft. Right. I, I, I love that, and I love to hear that you guys are like still friends now. Like I, I oh yeah. That. So that's great. 
So, so what's Isol like? What's your favorite memory of directing the film? Like, what, what, what scene, what experience kind of sticks out to you? Yeah, I mean, there are just kind of a few scenes that I mean, a lot of the scenes were just everything is so hard. I think the hardest were like when we have a lot of extras, when you know you have to deal with circumstances that you know you don't feel like you can totally control because you mm -hmm. maybe have non-actors who are you know that can be a little bit hard but little moments like for example let's say the interrogation scene mm -hmm. where um, Papetita who plays Adya is being interrogated in this little blue room by a police officer and um, Laura Christian Thora is there with eye contact we're playing with all this this massive mm -hmm. tension in the room of Christian Thora responding to the fact that she is responsible for the arrest of this poor woman, mm -hmm. trying to maintain pride because she's this officer. Mm -hmm. But yet you can see it in her eyes that she's like, what have I done? Right, and right. these little delicate moments when I, you know, those are scenes when I'm do, when we're, we're there in the moment, I'm like, this is gonna work. And I know it's right. gonna work and I, cause I can just see it and feel it. I, I don't feel panic like, oh, because the, the panic scenes are like, we have a cat, it's hard to control. Right, <laughs> right. So I have this because da, da, da. But the little scenes where you have the professional actors in a room and when they have, you know, not all the chaos, you can mm -hmm. just focus on the moments. That one, I also like the one I told earlier about um, the moment of truth when they're sitting in the car mm -hmm. uh, and they're really opening up, I also knew the same thing. I was like, this is working really well. I knew mm -hmm. it. And, uh, but, you, but you just wanna get as much get many takes as you can because you just wanna make sure you get it totally perfect. Right. But it, because it, especially with that one, I was always afraid of it. But then you have the two in the room, I'm like, or in the car actually. And I also knew, I'm like, this will work. So it's, it's really fun when you're in a, on a scene and you know it's working. Right. And you, right. You know, there are days when you're like, oh my God, that was crazy. There were so many things <laughs> that didn't deliver. This, you know, we're, we're behind, blah, 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 blah. But um, yeah, it's, that's the, the, those are the fun moments of being, in a, being a director. There's, and then in the editing room, of course, when all of a sudden you've- It all comes a, together, right? Yeah, when you've cut a scene with the editor or the editor's done, and you're like, wow, it's a movie. <laughs> And I love when it happens. And I am, like I said, I, I couldn't say more about the film. I watched it one time and I watched it again and I saw certain things. And I, you know, again, for Christine, I love the dynamic um, you had with uh, Adia. And, and I just think it, it's such a great film for like women to just kind of, the women supporting women, right? Yes. Um, so, and the storytelling is great. Yeah. And um, so I, totally appreciate you know we've got like a, just a minute left um christina if you thank you so much um for kind of wanting to hear those pieces be personally like selfishly <laughs> have happy to hear like you. You about the relationship great film um Isold, you're going to be sticking around uh with us um to, to further talk about um the film and you know some other issues but uh christine great performance uh Thoroughly loved it. I'm promoting it to all my friends. Uh -huh. Appreciate you. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think we'll be moving on to the next part in a minute. Great. Talk faded. Talk. Great. Um, so. Well, this is a uh, thank you for Isol for staying on, and um, I'm excited to have this next conversation um, with you all about borders and boundaries and how stories can influence geographical, political, and emotional boundaries. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to introduce um, a few women who are going to be joining us. Uh, we will be joined by Icelandic editor, Elizabeth Rolandsdalter. Sorry, I'm killing these names, but I'm trying my best. Um, Norwegian producer, Elisa Fernanda Pereira, and American producer, Heather Ray. Um, and then, yes, and then Isol will be sticking around. Yeah. 
And I think that's it. So welcome, ladies. Like I said, I'm excited to have this special conversation about borders and boundaries and, um, and how your stories influence, right? Um, you know, so let's get started uh, with each one of you just speaking a little bit about um, like, you know, some of your films and how your films impact boundaries, emotional, whatever. So let's start with Elisa. Well, wow, it was a very big question. I mean, just to start. Uh, well, I can just say to, um, I can start telling that um, I am myself in Guatemala. I moved to Norway when I was 16 years old. Uh, it's a long story. So it, I, I, I don't know. I, I just want to, to tell a little bit of my background because it, it has a little bit to say uh, about which movies I select to produce, I select to, to mm -hmm. make, and um, which kind of movies like I dare to see and I want to see. So, uh, you know, it was just when I was a teenager, it was impossible for me to think I will make movies. It was like mm -hmm. as surreal as being an astronaut, you, you know, it's something you see in the TV, but it's not something mm -hmm. you think you can actually be or become in a way just like okay movies okay this is the television my grandmother sees some movies but I'm gonna become a doctor right <laughs> right so when I came to Norway so it, it wasn't part of the plan like I'm gonna be an artist or a filmmaker it kind of happened because it was so difficult to learn the language so mm -hmm. suddenly it was very difficult to all the things I was very good on before I came here like math and science and are, I mean, literature, all the things I actually love became very, very difficult. And then I just yeah. realized that with movies, I could communicate to people without using words and without right. uh, using the Norwegian, I mean, the Norwegian language. I could like kind of communicate with people in other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just got like this kind of existential crisis when I just realized there are very few people that looks like me on the TV on film. Mm, Why? <laughs> Why? And you wanted to do something about that, right? You wanted yeah. to address that. I just got very, very like fascinated about that. Like, this is very weird. Like, why are we mm -hmm. telling the same story so many times? Uh, and it has influenced my work as a producer a lot because I just start finding stories that are difficult to, to find and tell. So I work a lot with indigenous cinema in other Norway uh, mm -hmm. and trying to find people that like me, that they didn't know they were able to tell stories. Mm -hmm. So I have been working That's... a lot. Yeah, sorry, Robin. No, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you. I, I love how that brought you to this. So maybe tell them like what, what one film story sticks out that you've been a part of that kind of Yes, I mean, addresses right now, the borders and boundaries and the things that they want to impact. Yes, right now I'm working with an uh, uh, indigenous musical, actually, no, <laughs> that okay. we're going to shoot ne next year. Uh, this year we're having two sh shootings. I work in a company, so I work a lot with Art House Cinema. Okay. Uh, and I have been co producing a lot with Latin America. Uh, okay. There's a passage of Ciro Guerra. So it's, diff it's different kind of projects from directors that they are making their first future to okay. quite of no directors. But the projects I have right now on my table that we're gonna shoot next year is a TV show about a Sammy Wedding. It's a drama, a comedy drama. Okay. Uh, with your first time <laughs> showrunner. <laughs> and uh, some indigenous musical about uh, a woman confronting herself, uh, trying to stop a mining company in Norway. So it's kind of political and artistic projects. Uh, I, did, I love that. Yes, <laughs> I know. I love that. Great, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> love that. Um, so, Elizabeth, you're next. So, tell oh, us. Some, <laughs> yes, you're you're next. We want to hear how some of your film impacts these boundaries. Or I don't direct or produce. Okay, I edit them. Uh, I'm a mother of four from Iceland. Okay. Um, and I, I have been working in America a lot now for the past eight okay. years. 
more and more, not because they make better films, but they do pay better. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's, I think you could almost take every good movie and discuss the characters from that subject, boundaries and borders. Yes. That's what yes. we're always dealing with uh, emotionally. But yep. then again, it's extremely difficult to work with it in a movie. And one uh, one film, uh, it's Atomic Blonde, which was a movie that happens in Berlin uh, when the mm -hmm. wall is coming down. And it was all about walls that people built up around themselves to protect mm -hmm. them. And it was probably the hardest movie I worked on because the main character is lying to you through the whole movie. So gotcha. it was really difficult to, you know, just make that flow in the story and make the ending make sense after you've been lied to for an hour and a half. But no, I, I, I think all our lives are about boundaries and borders. If it's mm -hmm. physical or emotional, that's what we breathe and live. And that's what our characters are made of, I believe, in movies. Heather? Hi. <laughs> Hi, Heather. Hello. So, yes, hello. So have your stories influenced you? Geographical, political, emotional boundaries. Um, and, and I pose this to you. I'm going to do a part two, even though you two already went. Um, and does it matter that you're in different parts of the world or that, are there more similarities than not in your thinking about how you impact these boundaries? Well, thank you very much first for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, Great I, to have you. Thank you. I'm zooming in from my trailer. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, good. On the set of a television series and we are in um, New Mexico. So I'm on the ancestral lands of Ute, Comanche, Apache, right. Pueblo. That's, I'm kind of the, the nexus of a lot of ancestral lands. Love and. It been here for a few months and I'll be here for a few months more. Um, I, I definitely have worked on a lot of films like this series I'm on right now, but I've mostly worked on movies. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked on a lot of films that, that uh, are very much uh, inspired by the land where the story takes place. Um, mm -hmm. You might say the land is a character in and of itself. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have worked on films that I think um, resonate with the theme of this conversation, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, but one of which would be Frozen River, uh, which is mm -hmm. a film by Melissa Leo and um, Misty Upham, the late Misty Upham. Um, Misty is no longer with us. Um, and that film really dealt with, you know, not just the borders between these two women, but also just looking at, you know, this conversation around the Northern border. In other words, in the United mm -hmm. States, a lot of conversation about the southern border, but less conversation about the, nor the northern border. Um, and some of that has to do with just racism um, mm -hmm. and white supremacy, uh, but also it's just to their different politics, you know, with each border. Um, and, and so I think that's a film that, you know, challenges some of our notions about the northern border, um, but also it's, it's about these two women that come together and find each other across cultural lines. Um, because Melissa Leo is, you know, a woman of European descent that lives in like a trailer court and she befriends this Mohawk woman and they end up helping each other out, you know. And another film that I've worked on a lot of films that have this theme, in, in, interestingly enough, where mm -hmm. people kind of come together and find each other and support one another. Another one, a film I produce that I produced is called Tulula which starred okay. Ellen Page, now Elliot Page, and Allison Janney. It's about these two women, um, then Ellen Page, you know, being a young woman living in a van who takes a baby and just this, you know, but then these two women come together and help each other out and, and, and transform each other's lives, you know. And then this past year, uh, I was one of the producers on a film called Bull, um, which premiered in Cannes. Uh, the year before and stars Rob Morgan and then a young woman who we basically found through, you know, an extensive casting process in, in Texas. Um, but that story takes place in and around 
um, the black rodeo communities of Southern Texas, um, which, you know, black rodeo is a big deal in the American South, but we don't necessarily mm -hmm. know. We haven't seen those right. stories. And that's the story of, you know, a black man who had a life as a bull, as a bull rider, but then kind of as sometimes they do, when your body's breaking down, you might start bullfighting, you know, what used to be called okay. rodeo, and now it's called bullfighting um, in more, more contemporary terms. But, you know, he's aged into being a bullfighter and he befriends this 14 year old neighbor who's a young white girl. And, um, and it's just this really interesting friendship. And she ultimately starts riding bulls. Um, oh, okay. Really interesting story about, again, two people from different sides of a perceived yeah. order who help each other out. So I somehow must be drawn to those kinds of things because I've worked on a lot of films that, that tell those kinds of stories. And even the show that I'm on right now, the scenes that I just came from shooting is these uh -huh. two families that are very different. One family very wealthy, one family very salt of the earth. And the scenes that we're just shooting is them coming up on this fence that divides them, three of them on horses and three of them on ATVs. And interesting. So I was watching, I was like, that's interesting. This conversation we're going into is about this notion of boundary. In this case, yeah. a boundary of values and class. It's six men, you know, three on horses. And what says, right, interesting. All a conversation around class, you know, and values. Yeah. So, Which is great. <laughs> That's great, which which leads us into like Esau, um, and uh, you know we just had a conversation about her film and and breathe normally, um, which is kind of just that. So Esau, do you want to tell us a little bit about? Yeah, I mean um, it's interesting um, the films Heather is describing. I mean I I went to Columbia University, so I I saw Frozen River because it's directed by Courtney Hunt, who actually went to Columbia. Okay. So we all you know when somebody does a you know, does great work um, as as an alum, <laughs> alumni of Columbia or at any film school. We're always like one of our own. We're, so we're always very proud when somebody right. succeeds and does something great. So I remember seeing um, Frozen River, maybe it's t been 10 or 15. I don't know how many years it's been, but it feels like it's been a, a while. And um, and now when, uh, when, when I hear it described, I'm thinking, I'm like, maybe I was, because you don't even know where you're, where your inspirations come from. They come from so many different places, but I do remember feeling like this is the kind of movie I want to make because it's, you know, because it's not about like, you know, it's about these intimate, like it tells these big uh, geopolitical stories and in an intimate way. And it mm -hmm. can sometimes tell such big, you know, you can, you can comment on the world without having to go to any ex extreme like that so we have you know we have boundaries we have these two women on two different sides of of this border and then they're they're helping mm -hmm. one another so you know all these when you mention all these things I'm like huh it's like exactly like my movie but I didn't even know <laughs> that I was right. like feeling from this film um and the same with um I think you said Talula is that is that how I say the, the title yeah Talula. exactly so it's th those similar themes so I, I'm yeah I'm always drawn to first of all I I somehow I've been asked like, oh, do you are you do you always have to write female characters? And I don't. It's not a conscious decision. It just happens naturally. And uh, and there's something about ha having women who may on the surface appear to be different or in different circumstances, and then maybe are drawn into, you know, drawn to one another by coincidence or by circumstance or. Or whatever, so it is something that I um, that I I'm drawn to both. You know, her, her those films. I haven't seen Bull, which I clearly have to see now. Um, but in the in the case of my film, I did want to talk about boundaries, and and I did notice that when I the culture of the landscape of Icelandic film was, we were quite white, and we were a bit nationalistic in the stories that we chose to tell. So one of the, the goals was let's, you know, why, why don't I, I need to include non-white people. I need to, I need, mm -hmm. to you know, need to talk about other things besides our kind of, you know, heteronormative worlds. Mm -hmm. and, like, Ali, uh, like Alisa said, you know, people didn't look like, you know, like we, we yeah, need to have exactly. the landscape look differently. So that, that was always a desire. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And, and you know, then when you start working with bound, boundaries and borders, there's so much to work with that, you know, I decided to place it in an airport area because that kind of, it, you know, it, it's maybe, you know, some could say it's on the nose, but it just felt right because we're talking mm -hmm. about um, an asylum, which happens to really literally be in the airport town. So that is, that is accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. We have all these fences. There's, there's a lot of fence. Um, and then there's this notion of some groups can come and go via the airport as they please, obviously prior to COVID, but, right. um, you know, and then there's this other group that doesn't have that luxury of being able to go, come and go as they please due to their lack of papers, lack of documentation or lack of resources or lack of, you know, privilege. And uh, so, I, you know, I did, I, I think as I was developing this material, I did kind of want to touch upon all of these little things. And, and then there's always this goal of how do I do it in a way that doesn't feel too overt and try right. to tackle it right. in a somewhat subtle way. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to, you know, I will continue to be drawn to these, these micro stories that, that um, have maybe great, greater meaning, meaning, um, but on the surface, they, they feel, they feel small. And I remember my film being called small by some producers. And I was like, what do you mean? It's a small movie, but small. it is, a, they call it a small movie, but I always feel like, well, it's a, it's, it's a, a code. It's a code for no explosions. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. I was, I was just going to ask, explain what that means. I, yeah. you know, I have no idea. Yeah, what maybe what somebody can, okay. can take it from there, but yeah, <laughs> small movie. I was, uh, I wasn't willing to accept that label, but I, I, I understand it. maybe in the grand scheme of things, perhaps. Elizabeth, did you want to expound on that or? Expand on what she's saying, Isol? Yeah, yes, as far as, you know, films and, want, and having kind of a, a purpose behind um, changing things and bring, bringing certain things out. And I know, Alisa, you also touched on that, so we'll get to you next. Yeah, no, I, I love to try to choose my films carefully, but mm -hmm. that's also a privilege being, right. as an editor, it's a privilege. Right. So I am in a different position in the sense that I do not have any, um, I do not have any uh, powers over, you know, how the script is written or who is casted, et cetera, et cetera, or what the story is. But I, I I try to change my little world in a different way. Like uh, mm -hmm. when I start working on a movie as an editor, I just sit down and just look at the whole cast. And I look at the women, I look at the people of color and just, just to make a promise to them. Right. I'm not meeting them, just looking at the photo, right. making a promise to the women, to the people of color that I will do my best to think twice before I cut them out or, cut down their dialogue, gotcha. you know, just to give them this extra nurture. And I think it's important because I'm raised in a racist, misogynist society. So we're all kind of colored by it. Mm -hmm. So it's important for me to remind myself of it, that some decisions I might get might be based on that, you know, racist, misogynist upbringing that mm -hmm. I have my own society so so that's just a little thing I do before every movie in the hope of changing at least that my small little world that way yeah and and it's not you know it's you definitely have yes a different position right but again yeah. I you probably feel like the same responsibility that our you know a writer or, or the producer feels like you said making sure you have a, a a similar lens with not cutting something out that that means so much to either that actor or yeah, the director. Yeah. Or, so Absolutely. Um, you, you have very to, it's an important position. And yes, right. you can make or break a movie, basically. And that's right. a lie. But um, but it's still, yeah, but for me it's just working. I mean, I do action movies. Mainly. Okay. That's my main, main, thing. main source of income. Or so that's how you know about the blowing up stuff, right? When small doesn't have blow up. 
that, that doesn't keep it. me, but yeah, but uh, <clears throat> but no, um, I think all of it matters because all mm -hmm. of it is going to the cinema, all of it is raising a new generation of moviegoers, those big mm -hmm. movies. So I think it's important to have a position where you can go in and try to ground them, <clears throat> make them less misogynist. Mm -hmm. But I worked really hard on that. Um, so yeah, you know, I can try to move things there. And I, I do, I work hard. Do you, th do you think people understand that? Like, like editing, editing out a piece of a movie like could really impact kind of like you know the boundary like do you think people like people outside of like the industry like really kind of understand that because I for me like I once you started speaking I was like yeah that's a huge thing. like you you have a huge responsibility because well you know all this film is like done you know done it's acted you know everything shot like you have a huge responsibility to kind of keep things together or it, take things out that could change a storyline or change a direction for you know for somebody's view and so that's a huge responsibility but I'm still, I do feel my uh, responsibility is towards the director's vision and vision, right. because producers today are, are very much hands-on artistic uh, mm -hmm. creative producers mm -hmm. creative producers so my responsibility is to get their vision get as close to their vision as possible but if i walk into a wall which has happened which okay. could be for example misogyny in an action movie mm -hmm. to make it ladies close-up stuff i i take that discussion right. fiercely about cutting it out and why we should cut it out you okay. know and when you when you get this women don't like action well maybe right. they like like action but don't like the misogyny you know right you have to balance you balance that out yeah. and yeah because you kind of yeah. show the right well, side to this once so. them to like your movie don't put them down you know right right i hear you i hear so, you so but you're still always following a director's and a producer's vision of what the movie is going to be and then yeah then you just do your best to that you do your, that's all you can do is do your best <laughs> So, uh, Elisa, like, so how do you, how do you, um, you know, I mean, you touched on, like, you didn't see, you didn't see folks who kind of look like you, like, so in your role, like, how do you kind of make sure that you stay true to you and what, you know, women, what you see, think women need and, you know, kind of make, like, the film or whatever you're working on, like, kind of a safe space for women and, 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 how, and our feelings? Wow. You, you make some good questions. I mean, I really need I'm to sorry. I'm asking questions. That, <laughs> so these are all like personal to me. I'm like, how do you do that? Because again, I'm on the business end of the entertainment. So on the creative side, you know, when I look at something, I'm like, somebody had to like have been very, you know, smart about how things are and, you know, and, and, and dealing and speaking to a lot of directors and producers and editors. Like it's, it's fascinating to me, like how, you could take a film and then, you know, one vision here. And then once it gets to the editor, like you said, Elizabeth, you know, the, the, this action film is great. So why do we need these two naked women in here, right? Like, so how does it get from those pieces? So I know you all kind of have that vision and I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. Well, I feel like I'm very privileged in the position I have because I, uh, I was crazy enough when I was 22 years old, I made a future movie. Uh, okay. And then I just met uh, the person that is my colleague. I became my mm -hmm. mentor, and she worked very hard. Uh, Maria Eckerhold is the leader of Merfield, and she kind of saw some potential in me when I was very young, and mm -hmm. I kind of got the privilege to start an established company that was fighting fighting a lot before me, mm -hmm. and she gave me the power to select and choose ideas and stories I wanted to tell so mm -hmm. I'm in a very privileged position I mean not just making art we're working as a producer in Norway is like mm -hmm. a very special position to have worldwide I feel because it's, we have a great financial assistance in Norway and I, I got a, a lot of support from the very beginning and of course it's 
it's difficult because you want to make the I mean I'm I get very in love with my projects like totally in love when I read when I read a script and mm -hmm. I kind of uh, I, I don't like thinking uh, I'm going to just to select projects that looks like me but in a way so I do that because that's the projects mm -hmm. I have some kind of passionate to when I see mm -hmm. okay I understand what you're going through I know I can right really understand this character i can really understand yeah. this kind of cinema without mm -hmm. thinking about the track record of director and suddenly so i'm working a, with a lot of female directors that represent diversity mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you can relate to them you yeah, can relate, relate to them so mm -hmm. uh, and of course i work also with some white male directors and some white female mm -hmm. directors but most of my directors represent diversity and I think it's because I kind of relate to the same matters, the same issues, the same kind of uh, seeing the world. And not just in Norway, I'm co-producing uh, two African projects and working with different uh, co-productions in Latin America and one in Lithuania actually. So you kind of find some projects that you see, okay, this is something I haven't seen before. But I really relate to that. This is really mm -hmm. me okay. in a way. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, and I'm in this privileged position, right? Because I, I'm so lucky to live in a rich country, actually. Right. So I can actually find the funding. And it's easy for me to take care of that vision because uh, I'm kind of represent that group, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's like easy for me to take care of them, to give them a lot of love. And to tell them, like, this is a great story. Really, mm -hmm. you are so great. I, I don't matter if you don't have education, etc. So this year I have I produced two short films that were Oscar contender for first time directors, one of them without any education at all from Guatemala. And the first time he was using a video camera, indigenous director. And you have the privileged position to that you can feel this is a good story, this is a great mm -hmm. idea. Let's make mm -hmm. it happen. That's great, so, and that, yeah. that's what you—that's what you want. That's the, you want to work in a place where things feel like comfortable for you and relatable. So that's great. Um, we got a couple of questions in, um, and we'll start with you, Heather. Um, can the participants participants talk a little bit about the background and how they became filmmakers? Alisa, I know you've already kind of done that, so we'll start with Heather and go um, yeah. go from there. Um. I grew up in central Idaho, so I'm from the American West. Um, okay. I grew up in a way that's very simple. Um, you know, for many years, we didn't even have running water and electricity. Um, but I was always around a lot of art. You know, my, my dad was a banjo player and my mom was an artist. She did, you know, really incredible beadwork and, and different kinds of art. And so I, I was around a lot of music and also a lot of storytellers like mountain storytellers, really. Um, and, and so it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I actually had ever even really thought of the idea of making film or even working with images. But I came across somebody who had a camera and just started filming things and, and just realized that I was somebody who definitely saw the world in images um, mm -hmm. and, and, and realized that there was such power you know, and what you can do with images and the stories you can tell. So I did go to film school. Um, and once I graduated from film school, I went to Evergreen State College in Washington State, outside mm -hmm. of Seattle, um, which is a really great film school that had a very experimental program. Um, and so there was a lot of film theory and a real conversation around how we're making movies, as opposed to just how to make a movie, but how are we doing it? What is process? How, what are we thinking about? What is mm -hmm. the meaning behind the images that, you know, that we're creating? Um, and I'm really thankful for that. And, Cause then I moved to Los Angeles and started working in the movie business. Um, right. And for the first number of years, I actually worked for Sundance and helped to create the Native American program, which my good friend Bird Running Water now runs that program. And, um, but that was a program that was essentially, you know, designed to to foster the voices of a native indigenous people. And at first it was just within North America, really in the United States. But then the program began to expand and it's and it certainly is a global program at this point. But 
And my work has really always been framed around supporting the voices of, you know, perhaps the, the underrepresented. It's always been a part of mm -hmm. what I've been working with, you know, Native and Indigenous filmmakers within my broader creative community. Um, I've supported and worked with Muslim filmmakers, um, filmmakers from poor and rural backgrounds, um, you know, a number of women. I've worked with a lot of first time filmmakers, you know, making their very mm -hmm. first. Um, I am a mother uh, and I'm also a grandmother. Um, my grandmother, my granddaughter is five years old today. Today's her birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> And, and so I have a very strong connection to family and community. And, and I feel like that the independent filmmaking community is very much about that, you know, mm -hmm. really about community and supporting one another and creating something out of nothing, you know. All right. In the United States, there isn't any state funding for the arts. Um, it really all comes through the varying systems of industry, um, mm -hmm. or perhaps, you know, wealthy people or something like that. Um, and so, which is amazing when you think about it, right? It, I mean, it's like this very it's like mind boggling, yeah. Like the richest countries in the world, and it's like there's no support for the arts, arts but right, it's crazy. scrappy, you know, we're scrappy, mm -hmm. and, and in terms of you know, we make films from nothing, and and I, I, I am grateful for that, uh, you know, that foundation. And, and I come from poverty, I come from rural poverty. So again, you know, like we, we always learned how to make something from nothing. Um, right. So that in some ways translated into being a filmmaker and being an artist in a way that it distills it down to the actual essence of what it is, which is storytelling, which in many ways is, is an archaic form. It's ancient, you know, storytelling is ancient. I hear you. <laughs> I, 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 it is and you know hopefully somebody sees something one day and some the government or whatever starts funding you know the arts to, that well, I'm going to stop there because I could talk about that for a while uh, and I won't so uh Esau and I can't remember if this was part of the first half hour of the conversation but like how did you get how did you really get involved um in filmmaking yeah um it's yeah it's trying to figure out how to say this in a brief way because it's a long, <laughs> it's a long story. But, um, but I, I was always interested in the film. I, I, I always, as a child, envied people. You know, I would see a video camera here and there, maybe more as a teenager because they were so rare uh -huh. when I was younger. But it, and I, remember, and I do remember, you know, somebody, a friend of my grandmother having a VHS player. It's like, uh -huh. wow, you can, you can just bring a movie and watch it. And I was, I was fascinated by this world where you know films existed on on something you could just watch them and then <clears throat> we did then get a camera I was probably age 17 or so uh -huh. and I think I documented everything I saw non-stop my siblings my parents I would sit in my room and create weird abstract scenes with maybe some highly dramatic classical music underneath because I didn't know how I would otherwise edit so everything uh -huh. has in camera uh, so there, w there was this constant desire to go into this field without really knowing how to do it. And at my um, school around age 17, uh, it's called Metaskoli in Icelandic, only the boys were part of the video club. And it didn't even occur to mm. me to join this video club because it was just kind of felt kind of tech nerdy. Mm -hmm. And it didn't cross my mind that I should try to, you know, enter. Be a nerd. Be a nerd. <laughs> yeah, or just <laughs> nerdy. Didn't you know? It didn't. I, it's some strange. I didn't really associate it with film. It was just some people Got in it. some club or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember later when the internet came into existence, what it was probably before Google. There was a web crawler or something, and look looking for like, oh, where do you study film? How does this work? But there there was something called the the um, Icelandic Film School. I was twenty two. And there was no no films, there was nothing, but there was an evening program in the evenings. And I remember seeing it advertised in the newspaper and I was like, wow, this this is it. This is this is where right. I go. And it was quite expensive at the time. It felt, you know, nothing like what actual film school costs, but it felt expensive then. Mm -hmm. And I somehow was able to, you know, scrap together enough to to do it. And then 
it would be an evening course. We ended up after the semester making one short film, but everything about it was exciting to me. And I couldn't decide, I'm like, do I want to be an editor? Do I want to do sound? Sound seems so uh -huh. fascinating. Every field, maybe I was probably, you know, maybe least in costumes or makeup or something like that. I, didn't, I wasn't, that wasn't quite my, uh, my, my forte. I didn't have any talent in that field, but everything uh -huh. else was totally fascinating. And, um, but I was at the University of Iceland and, and after that, I decided to move to New York. And despite this, this incredible desire to go into this field, there was this great fear of the things, this thing called screenwriting. I was like, I don't know how this, how people write a screenplay. I, I don't even know, this, I don't know how this works. So I decided to apply for something called interactive telecommunications, which is kind of at New York University, part of Tisch School of the Arts. Yeah. Yep. where I felt like I'll learn how to edit, I'll learn how to use all of this technology. And this is like in the beginning of the, or the early, you know, this is early 2000. So mm -hmm. the internet was new and people were making CD-ROMs and it just felt like everything was possible. So I took a lot of video art classes and learned how to edit. And from there, I, I started working in editing in New York City in documentary editing. First as an assistant, like long nights, and then um, in the daytime. But, and during that time, I decided to make my first short film, which is called Family Reunion. Um, okay. About a kind of closeted lesbian coming to Iceland for a family reunion, carrying a secret, but to, only to learn that there's some other family secrets that she's not aware of. And, uh, and this was, you know, this was kind of my first, um, I guess, leap into directing. And it had taken me all that time to kind of muster the, of the courage to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel confident, I mean, confident as, as much as you can become confident about your script, but feeling right. like, okay, this is something I, I, I wanna talk about. And then thankfully we did get into Sundance once it was, had come all together. And that also helped me deal with, you know, self-confidence, which is part of, you know, what we all, all struggle with, especially in the early years. And, right. uh, and then after that, there were a lot of short films that followed. And eventually I did, decided to do a master's at Columbia Film School. When I decided this is gonna be my life, I'm gonna, I wanna know everything. Mm -hmm. I need to just learn it all. And, um, and following Columbia, it was the whole process of writing, financing. All, he learned all of it, everything, everything, all the pieces. Everything. But yep. yeah, so it feels, you know, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but, <laughs> And it's only my first feature, but yeah, that's that's the story. I think you, I think there are a lot of people who feel like you, so that that's pretty normal. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, um, is this someone who inspired you to this day? And Elisa, you you ladies think about this too, or maybe some work that inspires you to do something as great. Um, I know Elizabeth, you touched on like the 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 directors and their visions and having to be, you know pretty honest about like, you know, what they want as you're editing. So maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Or, so or a specific asking, person. Is there someone I aspire to become like, or? I, or, or, some, or someone who yeah, inspires you to this day. Um, and again, you're in a very a kind of different position. Um, was there one, maybe I'll flip it a little bit. Was there one specific, you know, director whose work you, you paid extra special attention to and made sure you edited it correctly for whatever reason, they were inspiring. <laughs> just one. Just one. The rest was like with the left the rest hand. rest you just did your job. <laughs> no, I am obsessive. <laughs> I, I go into a project, a project uh, obsessively. So okay. I dream it, I think about it all day. I'm like, so it becomes like my baby. Uh, and but I don't have any favorites. I'm always just okay. obsessed by the project I'm working with right now. Gotcha. You know, I'm gotcha. All I can think of, all I can dream of. But I do my favorite situations is working mm -hmm. film uh, with uh, with people that are with their wholeheartedly in movie making, like telling stories. Right. 
And I have to say, I've worked on independent films in Europe, both Iceland and Denmark, Faroese. Uh, I worked with uh, big budget, mega budget movies in mm -hmm. America. But the people you're working with, they all are there to tell stories, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes money can actually get in the way of you being able to tell the story you really want to tell. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be an asset in when it comes to the storytelling, you know. Gotcha. There are many, especially in America, like Heath spoke about, the, there are no uh, public funds. It's all private money. Yeah. So there are a lot of people you have to please. The bigger the budget is, the more people there are to please. You know, gotcha. the more people yep. that can affect the story you want to tell. But everyone is just wholeheartedly in this to tell a story. And I don't think, at least directors, editors, <laughs> we don't go into film to get rich because right. no one starts in a big budget movie. We all start struggling, I think. Um, Interesting. So it's always this... Um, urge to tell a story, to work with characters, to work with emotions. Yeah. So Elisa, is there someone who inspired, inspired you, inspires you to this day? Someone who's kind of given you like a framework on what to look for or how you should work? Uh, well, actually I could relate a lot to what Elizabeth said. Uh, and when you get in love and obsess with projects. Uh, and not like, I mean, I, I, I get very inspired working with people, but it's something about the idea, the story. And when Elizabeth say, I, I dream about the project, I think about it the whole night, I can really relate to that. And when you see mm -hmm. something in the editing and you, I, I, I sometimes dream about the, the solution, you know, in a scene and call the director and I have this crazy dream, what do you think about this? <laughs> and you mm -hmm. can't stop thinking about the project. I mean, it gets, uh, when it's going bad, you really feel it, when it's going good, you really feel it. Uh, and being with people working with this together. So I, I don't think there is a director in Spice Marie, but it's like the cinema working, being part of this, being part of working with people that gets totally crazy in love with the project a kind of obsessive mm -hmm. way together um mm -hmm. so i cannot mention uh, specific persons because it's, it's it's collaboration you know cinema is collaboration mm -hmm. and idea the original idea i mean you have to have fire for idea from the beginning to them because there's right. always going to be a lot of problems <laughs> right so um, i could relate well to you it. well and you mentioned uh earlier you mentioned maria ecker from Mirror film who helped you in the industry. Um, yes. Have the other uh, ladies gotten support from other women like that? Um, Heather, have you, uh, you know, been gotten support and there's like one person or some women who stick out in your head that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a long line of people um, that came before me, I feel like, mm -hmm. and people who really, um, you know, had a very strong influence. Um, and it's partly family, like my mother and my grandmother um, and my dad as well, um, people that I grew up around. Um, but it's also, you know, I was deeply influenced by the late filmmaker, Phil Lucas, who was a Chuck mm -hmm. um, who worked in the documentary space. And I was also deeply influenced by the late Merita Mita um, from New Zealand, who was a Maori filmmaker who you know, was one of my early mentors um, and supporters. And, I, you know, it's interesting. I thought about this a lot more recently, but sometimes it's just somebody making you feel as though you have something to say, you know? Mm -hmm. Just literally the validity of somebody listening. Sometimes, Validate, yep. You I know, can give you the permission to somehow know that you have something to offer. Now I'm a producer, so producing is different, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I'm in the business of being of service to others. You know, I'm in the service mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. so it's like a waitress or a bartender or like. Right, right. You know, I, I'm in service of somebody's vision. 
Um, and that's, that's something I take a lot of pride in. I think of that as a being a very sacred, you know, kind of act or a sacred art. Um, but I also have told my own stories. I've directed a few documentaries, one of okay. which was about another one of my most important mentors, which was a man named John Trudell. Um, okay. And he was a poet and he was a national spokesman for the American Indian movement. Um, and, you know, I made a documentary about him called Trudell um, that I worked on for years and years. And, you know, that was, again, somebody who, who so deeply influenced my way of thinking um, mm -hmm. and so deeply my development of consciousness and particularly as storytellers we have to have those great minds who influence us you know and help us mm -hmm. form our own consciousness I think that's really important you know and and sometimes that comes very naturally and sometimes it's something we have to seek out got it absolutely absolutely agree can I um, say Esau? Yes. Can I say one thing before you so because I did I, yes. I misunderstand you, stood your question because I agree with Heather wholeheartedly, but I also love the support of women in this industry, and that mm -hmm. I I seriously feel it's so important and there is so much support out there, both women in Iceland we kind of stick together and I hope. Mm -hmm. and support each other but also me coming to america to la to hollywood there was like this group of amazing women like that had done amazing things like doty dern who did for example memento edited memento uh, uh, tatiana rikel who did aitania joan sopel who did nocturnal okay. animals for example they mm -hmm. all they, it was almost like getting a second family. And I have to say, I love that when women, you know, are this supportive. That we don't- Supporting women. In, that we don't buy into that we are dividing a cake. We just it's, don't believe in the cake. Just go for it and support I, each other. And the cake is just gonna go bigger if it's there, I, you know. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree that. and. If we don't buy into that, then it's amazing what we can do when we stick together. All different pieces of this industry when we all can like just stick together and uh, and get things done. And so yeah, so that's why I'm thankful for um, for you know having having the the ears and the stories from you know ladies like you and being able to participate in these panels because the more I think we keep hearing from each other. Um, and hearing, you know, a, a different experiences and how we've kind of done some things that have changed things for us. But I think it's it makes it even more relevant that, you know, we women need to kind of stick together um, in this crazy industry because it is crazy. It is crazy. Um, let me check and see if there are any more questions from the audience. Um, oh, for Esau, um, what has the reaction been like in Iceland um, to end breathe normally? And are you hoping to get a conversation going regarding the refugee crisis? Yes, well, it's been a while since the film came out in Iceland. So um, mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, it came out, thank, I mean, I'm very grateful that it came out, you know, what, at a time when actually people can go to the cinema and all that. Um, we premiered at Sundance in 2008 and uh, 18, 18 in, uh, in January and then in Iceland in March. So I was, I did, I did speak on some panels at the time, but part of the Red Cross, we did screenings. So I, you know, it, the conversation was already, you know, probably ongoing and, and, um, and it had grown from when I first, it was interesting to watch how the, the conversation, you know, grew as I was doing all the research and as I was um, following up on, everything that was happening. Um, and sometimes I was afraid that my movie would come too late. So I was like, oh, hurry and bring this movie. It needs to be, it needs to be kind of relevant. It can't, it can't come too late, but somehow it, 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 it's always a relevant topic. It's always something that um, people are struggling with and uh, systems are always highly problematic. So um, it's, you know, I, I'm not gonna take any credit for adding to the con conversation, but I think there, I think it's more about the individuals who begin to think, the individuals who may have had a, had an opinion in advance, mm -hmm. thought they knew, knew it all, 
And then all of a sudden they're like, ha, huh, you know, because all of a sudden they understand exactly every step of the way. And there were children that went to see the film with their parents, they would say, uh, why doesn't she have a passport? Doesn't everybody have right. a passport? So you have 10 year olds, 12 year olds who don't understand that this thing that we in a privileged society take for granted is not something that everybody else has access to. So that was interesting for me that these young people, kids and teenagers who, who really began to think and see the world in a different way. And, um, and just, you know, gener and also there were a lot of you know, people of the older generation that would, that went to see the film. So I would, I would just get a lot of interesting reactions from a lot of different people. And it's hard for me to know exactly what the impact is, you know, precisely, but you know, every, person counts, even though my film was far from a bestseller in Iceland, there are no explosions like Elizabeth um, pointed out. So um, competing with some Hollywood blockbusters um, didn't come out so well box office wise, but um, you know, even those people that did see it, I think I'm, I'm just grateful that it, it impacted them and it, it made them think. And that was the, the general consensus is that yes. it, 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 um, it affected those who saw it. So that at least counts for something. That, that counts for a lot. Uh, that def definitely counts for a lot. Let me check and see if there's any more questions. If not, I think we're going to um, start like wrapping this up. Uh, any other comments, last comments from, um... oh, we got a question in. One more, one more question just popped in. What's all of your advice to inspiring filmmakers, filmmakers new to the industry? Uh, and again, like what, what one thing like would you say to stay true to, to do, not do? Let's just go around the horn, uh, starting backwards first from Heather first. Um, what I would say to anyone who is new to the industry or to filmmaking, because we're talking about a global industry, really, um, is that, you know, again, I go back to this idea that storytelling is an intrinsic form, you know, for us as human beings. And I think that, you know, filmmakers are really our nation's storytellers, you know, where mm -hmm. filmmakers are telling the stories of the people in so many ways, in the same way that people are when they're you know, in literature and, and even in music and various spaces, but there's something about the way that this medium is consumed on a global level, that in many ways we are narrative designers. And I think mm -hmm. we have to think of ourselves as narrative designers because in a lot of ways, at least from my perspective, we are creating images that are contributing to the future, you know, that are helping to design the future of how we will be as a people. We shape culture with, with filmmaking. Yes storytelling, we shape culture, we, we shape consciousness, we shape ideas and ideals. And I think that it's important to be inspired by that on the one hand, but also recognize that within that we bear a tremendous responsibility. And it's, it's an honor, the responsibility is an honor, but it is important to us to be responsible to that as well, you know, and to tell stories that actually are a contribution. Action or not, I love action movies. <laughs> It's not a value judgment on the kinds of movies, <laughs> but exactly what you were saying, Elizabeth, you know, you're, you're working within a specific genre, but you're elevating it by being responsible to something, which is having integrity in the representation of women, you know, and so on and so forth. And you told the kind of story, you know, that, that you, the kinds of stories that you describe telling, and Elisa as well, like you're, we're all telling stories that we hope are contributing something to the broader culture. So that's what I would say is just recognize the responsibility and celebrate it. Alisa? Well, um, when I decide to become a producer, my mentor, as you mentioned uh, later, Maria, that's the reason why I'm a producer right now. And the woman that has support me for everything. I mean, like um, she told me like, uh, remember to feel more and, and think less and uh, I think it's a very good advice to everybody because sometimes you think too much like 
what is what is a good movie what is gonna sell what is the great project and sometimes it sounds very cheesy but you just need to feel it it's a lot about feeling your intuition of, and if you really uh, are getting emotional uh, about something or really feel this is important this is really giving me something then you have to do it it's going to mm-hmm. be difficult. It's going to be crazy. You're going to make a lot of bad decisions, but that's that's why we are storytellers. Uh, that's why you're in this crazy industry, right? That's why I'm you, know, you, you didn't think it was going to be easy, did you? <laughs> no, no. But, but I, I'm very, very happy for that advice uh, uh, because after that, so I became a producer. I went to film school. I'm I'm still a producer today. Great. Great. Elizabeth? Well, if anyone asked, I would tell them to be fearless. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. Take the Mm -hmm. conversation, be honest, and have fun. Love that. Love that. Isol? Yeah. Um, Well, I think, yeah, a bit of, I think I'm going to share what they've all said. I mean, first of all, in, uh, assuming the people, these people who, who were talking to maybe are making short films, perhaps entering into the industry. I think it's really important to, ha- to, to be passionate about something. Whatever story you will tell, you have to burn for it. It has to be like the biggest, most important moment in that, at that time point in your life, because it's going to be a lot of struggle. There's going to be little money. And, uh, and, and then you, if it does well, you will hopefully attend festivals and have to speak to it and have a conversation so it has to be something you care deeply about um, and that's going to also come through in the work because you have a point of view on the subject mm-hmm. that you're tackling and so but that's one thing having an idea and having a passion but I think it's also good to attend panels attend talks attend anything that's film related in order to you know, build a team and, uh, you know, build allies um, mm-hmm. because it's hard to make a film alone, you know, by yourself. Um, and then it's, you know, this other simple thing is, you know, believe in yourself, be fearless, don't give up, just do it. Just just keep doing it because the first one might fail and then you have to do it again if, if it's what you truly want. Um, so you really have to want this because it's, uh, it's going to feel like a long journey, but hopefully in the end, it'll be worth it. Like I said, this crazy industry. Yeah. So, so well, thank you, ladies. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you all. Um, and thank you to the Icelandic Embassy for hosting the, the, this event. Um, so, but right now I'd like to invite uh, with the president, Helen Granquist, um to join us and to say a few words and on closing. Thank you very much, Robin. And thank you very much participants. I, as all of you in my living room in Sweden, and I was just thinking how grateful I am watching you sharing so much love with with each other. I know some of you from before. I don't think you know each other, but to listen to you this hour, and see how generous you are and how clever and and this wisdom and love you have shared. I can only say how grateful I am. And and, uh, yeah, from a WIFT international perspective, it's been such an honor to to listen to you and to gather you together. So thank you. And thank you, Robin, for moderating. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies.